Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Associate Director of Public Programs and Events here at the IDA. Thank you for joining us for what is going to be a wonderful conversation around the film Becoming Cousteau, moderated by IndieWire's Eric Cohn. Um, before we get started, um, as always, I would like to offer just a brief land acknowledgement. Um, I am coming to you today from Chicago, which is on the unceded land of the Potawatomi people who have been stewards of this land for generations. I would also like to thank our media sponsor, IndieWire, for bringing uh, this series to all of you this year. Um, we have a bunch more screenings upcoming, which you can check out at www.documentary. Dot org slash screening dash series. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Eric to get this conversation started. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. It's really good to be here. And I'm really excited about this conversation in particular because, you know, there are so many legacy docs out there about uh, major figures in popular culture or in the sciences who uh, we've been celebrating for generations, but a lot of times they don't ask the hard questions. And what I appreciated about this film in particular is that, like many people, I was someone who watched Jacques Cousteau on TV growing up and was very much impressed by what he was able to do. But what this film does is while acknowledging that nostalgia value, it also gives us much more about his story than uh, we often understand. So uh, with no further, without further ado on my end, I'd like to welcome the director of this film for a conversation, Liz Garbus. Please join us now. Hi, Liz, thanks for being here. Hi, hi, thanks for having me, um, IDA and Eric. So I guess the most natural starting point for talking about this movie is your relationship to Jacques Cousteau, how, what you knew about this career and his legacy prior to working on this movie and, and what drew you to, um, to go deeper? Um, well, like you, Eric, I grew up um, watching uh, Cousteau and his happy Calypso um, team of, uh, of adventurers and, you know, sort of was glued to that set and it filled my head with all kinds of, you know, Un unachievable fantasies of uh, sailing the world. Um, but um, I knew nothing about um, the sort of, I think what ultimately is his legacy, which is the kind of the education of a conservationist, um, that, that journey from that hubristic adventurer uh, who we got to know as a television celebrity to a very a deeply committed conservationist who was sounding the alarm on the climate emergency um, decades before it reached popular consciousness. Um, and um, for me, that, that was sort of a, a metaphor that was extremely timely because as we, um, you know, opened up the front page of the New York Times this morning, which was talking about, you know, the loss of 14% of our coral reefs, which are so important to maintaining um, so many species and um, our oceans, um, undersea world. That um, you know that that evolution from hubris and um, and adventure to um, protector is a metaphor for where we as a society um, need to go. So it felt like um, not just as you say that nostalgic journey that fills us all with those endorphins and happy memories, but also um, something very very timely for um, where we are today um, on this planet. Well, and just to back up for a second, what's also striking about it is that even though you're taking us to a different part of the story than we've really seen before, it's all told in archival. So you're working with all this material that was out there. Obviously, a lot of that was there from the show, but we're getting a lot more than the show. So what was the process like in terms of just the materials you had to work with and getting the access that you needed to uh, kind of assemble the documentary as, as, it, as it came together? Well, for the, I mean, it's a very, very long um, story and journey towards getting access to the archives. Since this probably will be watched by other documentary filmmakers, I'll probably go into a little more detail than I would with the general public. But it was, you know, it started. Um, not that there's anything, um, you know, uh, you know, 
it's just, I think that for this audience, it's just an interesting journey. Um, the, uh, it started six or seven years ago, this idea to make this film. Um, it really started when I was reading my son a book um, that was called Who is Jacques Cousteau? And it was, he was a young kid and it was part of this like series of books that introduces to historical figures. And it occurred to me that this hero of, of kind of my past was being lost to a new generation. And that started me reading and searching and looking to kind of find what was the larger story there that we just touched on in your first question, um, which was this kind of education of a, of a environmentalist. Um, so, but, you know, in order to do that, we needed access to his archive. And um, so back then, I think it was 2015, um, I reached out to the Cousteau Society, um, which I knew was controlled by his um, surviving uh, wife, widow, and, um, you know, asked about beginning that conversation. Um, it maybe took her six months to get back to me. <laughs> so during that time, I thought, well, maybe I should talk to some folks who might actually know, you know, know these people or have some of the archives themselves. And um, happily, I was able to start those conversations with Nat Geo, um, who has, you know, been in the Cousteau business since the beginning. I mean, when he, you know, they first published his photographs, of course, and then ultimately um, did shows with him. Um, and, um, and so through this kind of two pronged effort of mine, just reaching out, which ultimately I got a response to and National Geographic kind of bringing their brand to bear to the conversation. Um, it took only five years to actually <laughs> get, get our first trip into the archive. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that was the journey. And as you said, the film is living entirely in his visual world other than interviews that were done with him later. But um, I feel like when you have cinematographers like Louis Mal and Jacques Cousteau and the Calypso, um, Evo Mare at your disposal, um, that's the world you really want to be living in. So, um, so that that's, was the creative choice that I made. So, and so ultimately, how much material did you end up working with? Because it looks like we're seeing so many different eras throughout his life here. I can only imagine how many hours of material that would be. Yeah, it was about five, 600 hours of material that we had access to um, and that we, you know, we worked with the Cousteau Society who had an archivist who had been taking care and cataloging all of Cousteau's work um, to explore um, the archive. But thankfully for that partnership with that archivist, it wasn't 20,000 hours of footage, <laughs> it was five, 600. Right. So with all that material, how did you go about kind of figuring out the right way to shape a narrative that was not just about his professional legacy, but also in some ways a personal profile? We get these other details, his diary that Vincent Cassell reads, for example, specific moments in his life that are not necessarily part of the show that he put out there, but also very important for understanding sort of the psychology of the guy. Yeah, I, it, you know, it was a similar approach I did with um, my fellow about Nina Simone, which started with listening to them. Um, you know, like Nina, um, Jacques was interviewed, you know, many times for many, many hours over the course of his life. Um, and of course, in, he wrote, wrote books um, and was interviewed in print. And for me and my editor, uh, Pat Wasserman, um, you know, and, and writer Mark Monroe was about reading all of that and listening and trying to learn from him what was the story of his own life and his legacy in his view. Of course, um, you need to augment that with other voices, but, um, you know, you start to hear their stories, their stories that they think are, for them, are the stories that created them and created who they are. And, um, and um, building out from there um, was the way to kind of you know, approach and tackle that kind of material was listening to to him. And so what surprised you over the course of that process? I mean, obviously you can you can do a lot of research with the work that's out there in the books and, and so forth, but when you actually start going to primary sources, interviews and so forth, what what caught you off guard? Uh, I think I would say Simone Cousteau. Um, you know, in the archive were, um, you know, some audio interviews with his first wife, Simone, um, and um, I knew nothing about her, and I, I think that was by design. She was not in front of the camera. She was that, 
as her son le- said, you know, that woman behind the scenes who made everything work that nobody knows about. <laughs> and of course, through history, there have been many women like that. Um, and um, her spirit and her love of the sea and her saltiness and her um, leadership on board was just a, such a wonderful discovery for me. Um, and um yeah, that definitely surprised me. Of course, also his work with oil, um, oil companies, and that was the way that he funded um, his his crew and his explorations early on. Um, now, you know, looking back on it with our eyes, it's shocking to think that he took oil money. But of course, at that time, there was a very different um, level of consciousness about the potential dangers of um, oil extraction. Um, but, um, you know, he began to see those dangers before his own eyes. But, you know, those two stick out as, you know, kind of um, interesting surprises, both um, delightful and also intriguing. Yeah, and you touch on something else, which is that I think in the film, we see his own sort of gradual awakening to the fragility of the environment that he's studying. Uh, you know, early on, when we see him spearing fish and stuff. It's sort of the antithesis of the image we have of Jacques Cousteau. So I think there's something fascinating about what you do in the film and sort of his sort of gr- growing awareness that this was a fragile environment. And I'm curious, you know, to what extent you felt like you needed to sort of chart that path because you know, a lot of it is in the material, but it also has a different resonance now when, as you say, there's much more reporting, there's much more sort of responsiveness to uh, environmental causes. Yeah, I mean, I think seeing, um, you know, divers swimming, holding on to um, sea turtles or, um, you know, blowing up using uh, TNT to blow up um, areas under sea so they could study the fish that would, um, come up as a result of their uh, <laughs> blowing up this little area under sea was, is shocking um, in today's eyes. Of course, the slaughter of the sharks on board in the silent world was a better known example of, um, of their uh, early uh, interactions with um, undersea life. Um, and I think, you know, and Cousteau himself talks about this, like he envisioned himself as the John Ford or the John Houston of the undersea world. And that kind of hubristic, um, view of nature was one that he, um, as, you know, sort of conqueror and owner of nature was one that he, he um, espoused early on. And then, of course, only through experience of decades of working um, under in the undersea world did he understand how, um, how destructive that point of view was. And, um, you know, he said he couldn't even watch his own films anymore because he was so appalled about, you know, him and his crew's interaction with, um, with sea life. So, um, yeah, that was, you know, really part of the narrative arc that I wanted to explore, as I said in the beginning, because I do think it's very much a metaphor for um, where we are um, as custodians of this planet today. Was there anything that you came across during your research that you would have loved to kind of find space for in the film, but it just for one reason or another, it just didn't work with what you were doing? Yeah, I mean, there were really interesting stories about what she did um, during World War II um, and his relationship with her bro- his brother, who was a collaborator with the French, um, uh, the, the Vichy government in France, which was um, collaborating with the Nazis. Um, and, you know, you, that that was really interesting. Gilles worked with the resistance and he even has like a great spy caper of breaking into an office and stealing papers that would show the location of German ships um, that he brought to the French Navy. Um, And also him using his celebrity to gain a pardon for his brother who was a collaborator. Um, Mm -hmm. So there there were um, a bunch of stories in that arena that um, were in the film and then ultimately um, were cut out for, for time and sort of focus of the film. But there are certainly um, a lot of great stories to tell in this, in this man's life. Yeah, the other, the other thing that I'm sure must have been an interesting question for you is when you're talking to people who knew him and, and, and knew sort of how he presented himself, is what sort of challenges were involved in, in getting deeper, getting beyond kind of the popular mythology of Jacques Cousteau to have a more candid discussion about his personal life? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, in France, there's been controversy about the stewardship of his legacy. Um, I think there were those people who grew up um, 
you know, very attached to the Calypso crew, his first wife and family and felt, you know, sort of, um, you know, less excited about his um, second family and their uh, stewardship of his legacy and estate. I think partially um, because they were so protective of it, um, you know, there wasn't this exposure over in the past, you know, decades since his death that um, many people in France were hoping for. Um, but, oh my God, Eric, I've totally forgotten the question as I started speaking about it. Oh, that. what was off limits for discussion? What, oh, what oh, oh, hard oh. to get people to talk about? Oh, yeah. Well, there was nothing that was off limits. Um, I think there were those people who had ended up um, having negative experiences with the custodians of his state, a state who needed some convincing. But at the end of the day, we have creative control of this film and we were making the film and, um, you know, ultimately people who cared about um, Jeep, we made it clear that we were, um, you know, Switzerland. We weren't representatives of family one or family two. We were storytellers who are interested in the environment and in the legacy. Um, and it's much larger than that kind of um, sort of inside baseball struggle that, um, you know, really is not of concern to a global audience. Yeah. And, and what sort of conversations did you have about sort of the, the, the sadder side of his life? I mean, you, you sort of gradually bring us up to that point where we've sort of seen how talented he was and how driven he was. And then suddenly he says, I was a bad husband and, and father, which is really shocking to hear when, you know, you remember this character almost as like a father figure from childhood. So, you know, what was that process like of sort of demystifying that side of him? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we, none of us want to um, take down our heroes. And I think that, um, and certainly this is not a takedown. In fact, you know, I think that Jeek's legacy is, um, you know, and the prescience he had um, for sort of sounding the alarm on the environment is is, is celebrated in this film. But um, for me, when I, I make films about these extraordinary transformational figures, um, I want to humanize them. And um, to me, it's um, seeing people's flaws makes them relatable and, um, and makes their work kind of achievable for the rest of us. Um, he clearly uh, felt that in the service of his mission, he missed a lot in his life um, or was negligent on many fronts. And I think that there are many people who can relate to that. Um, and I think that it's, um, for me as a filmmaker, I think of myself as an empathy engine. You know, that's kind of what I, my goal is in the films that I make. And I think that, you know, in discussing our flaws and the sort of warts and all approach, um, everybody's on the same playing field. And, um, and it allows us to kind of um, relate and care in a, in a deeper way, I hope, than Hey Geography. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think you're more emotionally invested in the challenge of what he was trying to get done when you understand how, how much he was also a human being at the same time. And I think one thing that, that's worth looking at in this respect is that he's, he's been sort of uh, mythologized by popular culture. And I'm curious what your take is on what popular culture gets wrong about Jacques Cousteau. I mean, from a 21st century perspective watching this movie, I was sometimes thinking about Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou because you know they very clearly patterned that character after him into sort of a wistful Bill Murray character of sorts. But at the same time, for someone to be introduced to Jacques Cousteau through that prism doesn't necessarily get to some of the more complex elements of, of you know, why he mattered in the first place. Sure, and I think Wes was interested in that aesthetic world that the Calypso and Jacques brought to us, and he popularized that um, for a new generation, which um, I think is amazing because it, it did keep the legacy alive to some degree, but it was an aesthetic point of view and an entry point for his larger storytelling, which, um, of course, doesn't have a... Um, a responsibility to or or a um, allegiance to the Cousteau legacy in and of itself, right? And I think that um, the Cousteau legacy is this one of conservation and a journey from, um, you know, kind of arrogance to humility, um, if you look at Cousteau's life. And, um, you know, that was the journey I was interested in. Um, but I would love to do a double feature with Wes. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to do that. Well, and the other thing, you could do a double feature with this film and a lot of more recent environmental documentaries because it does seem like on some level there's a continuum 
uh, between the work he was doing, the work that other filmmakers are doing now to capture the environmental crisis in real time. And, uh, and I wonder what you got out of sort of the, the kind of last phase of his life. Uh, it seems like there was a point in which he became very sort of pessimistic about the direction of things, but you give us just enough of a sense that towards the end there, he might have been changing his mind a bit, that there, there was some potential to, to really get his message to sink in. But what, what overall did you think in, in terms of, you know, what, by the time he, he, you know, the end of his life, that last chapter there, how, just how much was he sort of seeing potential in the future of, uh, of his mission? Yeah, I mean, these questions sort of make me want to cry because, because, because you know, yes, I think in 1992, when it was the first global, um, they called it the Earth Summit, but it was really a climate summit, um, yeah. he, you know, he was hopeful. And he said, you know, if I look at the facts and I look at the science, um, there's every reason to be pessimistic about our global future, but human beings have the capacity to dream and to work. And that's starting here now. And that was 1992. Um, and, you know, and we're now heading almost 30 years later into our climate summit in um, Glasgow um, in a few weeks. And, um, you know, that work has not been done. And so while he was hopeful at that moment, um, it is just, you know, it's incredibly um, sad and alarming and also urgent um, to bring that message into, today, into today's conversation because so much time has, has gone by with not enough of that work he was calling for. Well, who would you say these days is sort of really the standard bearer and from a legacy standpoint? Who's, who's sort of carrying forward what Cousteau started? Well, there's nobody with that global platform and that global likability. And in today's environment, you know, people like Greta Thunberg um, get, you know, polarized and, and, and you know, a young, a young woman trying to fight for her planet becomes um, a target um, for political discourse. Um, you know, there's so few people who are able to unite us around this message. And what Cousteau did as one of the most recognizable human beings on the planet at that time and with you know huge approval and favorability and likability was um, you know sound the alarm for um, this world that he grew so passionate about and um, but of course as soon as his message got a bit darker um, he started to get canceled just a little bit right but like literally canceled right like off ABC into oh. you know networks that were more niche like PBS and TNT. Um, which were was amazing that he still had that show, but um, you know it's that um, tension between um, you know commerce and uh, and nature <laughs> that um, was expressed in that last act of his career, and I don't know that there's anybody who has been um, a uniting force since. Um, Al Gore is, of course, controversial. John Kerry is now our climate ambassador. Um, you know, and um, but but we are lacking in those figures who bring us together. Well, and part of, part of what I think the documentary gets across is that unlike the people you cited, which is not necessarily a knock on the work they're doing, but this is somebody who was willing to go, to put his risk life and limb and see these changes up close undersea. He even invented technology to do it. And uh, to me, one of the most poignant moments in the documentary is when you see him as an older man on the boat talking with these two kids who say, oh, we, we recognize this stuff because we've seen your show, which is- a, Those are a, his children. Oh, those were his kids, thank you. So yeah. I didn't even realize that when I was watching it because it went by fast, but to me- uh, it's We like, should have ID'd them, I guess, <laughs> we <should have> that. <laughs> no, but, but I think, I, I, I would have assumed that there were other people, other people of that age who could have a similar reaction too. And I wonder what, you know, what did you glean from sort of looking at the generational impact of Cousteau and, um, you know, the, the value of having a show like that on the air, because, you know, it's not like super easy for anyone to tune into it these days. It's incredibly difficult for anybody to tune into it. And I think, you know, look, it's not like this was some like ideal time where, you know, kids would pull up to their screens and want to be um, preached to about the dangers of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, 
oil extraction or coal, you know, I mean, it, as soon as he did get more political, for lack of a more subtle word, you know, he, his audience began to shrink and he saw that and he was pessimistic towards the end of his life um, for that very reason. Um, but he was able to bring extraordinary attention as witnessed by the fact that he was the only non-head of state, you know, invited to speak at that Rio summit. Um, you know, he was able to bring that incredible celebrity to bear on this crucial issue. And, you know, there are a lot of actors, you know, um, film directors, Cameron, Leo, you know, who, who sound the alarms about the environment, but there's no global uniting figure like that. Um, and, um, you know, that, that is um, a space that I hope we can find to choose that we can find to fill because there is nobody else. And why would you say the show is so hard to find these days? Hit the undersea world of Jacques, of Jacques Cousteau. Yeah. Um, well, look, technology has evolved so um, profoundly that the images that he shot, which blew our minds as children, are now all over, you know, many networks, right? You know, the wonderful octopus feature <laughs> that won the Oscar last year, you know, that was made possible in some sense by the technological achievements of um, Cousteau and his team of, um, of, of, of divers. So, um, so I think in some ways it's, um, you know, it's, the sh to me, what's important about the show is um, the learning and the, um, the experience of the man over the, the course of his career to become this protector for the environment, as opposed to actually seeing his shots of sharks versus what we can do um, with 4K or 8K today undersea. Um, and the show, I believe, is um, you know very hard to find because of issues around the estate, issues around um, uh, uh, licenses, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, um, technology has advanced so far that they do seem um, kind of kitschy at this point in time. But it's a wonderful kind of kitschy that's terrific to um, revisit as, you know, Wes Anderson popularized with, with, with his filmmaking. So uh, one thing I'm wondering is, uh, you know, you're an incredibly prolific filmmaker and you, you've documented so many different kinds of subjects. And in recent years, we have seen the environmental doc almost as like a subgenre. What is your relationship to the work being done there now that you've made this movie and how much do you feel compelled to kind of continue on this track given that, you know, you have a lot of different modes? <laughs> um, well, I don't think there's a bigger um, issue um, than protection of the environment. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of issues today. We have protection of democracy. We have a pandemic. We have, um, you know, I mean, so many, you know, we have racial justice. There are so many um, priorities. My films have certainly explored at least two of those um, subjects that I just mentioned, um, racial justice and democracy. But um, I, you know, so I don't know where it brings me next. But I do feel um, that um, there's no more important issue to be talking about. Um, and that, you know, again, so many of my fellow filmmakers are engaged in this discourse as well. And, and um, I know many of us will keep doing it. As we're speaking now, there's an oil spill off the coast of California that's getting some news press, uh, maybe some media, maybe not quite enough, but enough for people to know that it's happening. And people may watch this movie and, and think, well, I should probably do something here. So yeah. what, would you, what would you suggest as sort of a logical step for somebody who, who feels compelled to kind of, at least if not replicate what Cousteau was doing, you know, sort of contribute to that cause? Yeah, well, I mean, look, there's individual choices we can all make about reducing our carbon footprint and about, you know, what straws we use or don't use. But at the yeah. end of the day, it is, it is incumbent upon world leaders because they, the, 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 the work is so massive that it's beyond what you and I do in our daily lives. We can do that. We need to do that. Um, we need to make make sound choices about um, how much we fly, our cars, our straws, all of that. But at the same time, it's going to really be about um, nation states coming together to um, make some of the hard and very unpopular choices that will reduce 
um, you know, the warming of our planet over the next 20 years. And as, you know, the, the UN report that came out this past summer said, you know, we have a little window of time right now to reduce the most, you know, damaging effects of climate change. And um, this is a racial justice issue. <laughs> this is an issue for democracy. It actually, you know, is an issue that touches on on everything that's important. Um, and so um, for people being involved, I do believe it's about showing that public support for leaders who are willing to make um, decisions that may be costly in the short term in order to have a long-term future. And it's about political organizing and activism as well as personal choices. But personal choices alone will not get it without leaders having the courage to do some things that may be short-term unpopular. Well, it's hard to follow that up with anything that could sort of match its its uh, the profundity of what you just said. But I am very curious to know if you've ever gone diving and <laughs> what your relationship is to that particular challenge. Well, we should, um, yes, exactly, end with end with something more magical than um, and and leave us on a happy note. But um, yes, I have um, I have done scuba diving. I have to admit, I am terrified. I'm still terrified. I find the whole thing both incredibly wondrous, but also terrifying. So um, most of the time I am steeped in undersea imagery um, that has been brought to us by the incredible innovation of Cousteau on my screen, as opposed to up close and personal, because I'm a little bit of a scary cat. So you're not going back anytime soon. <laughs> well, I may. Perhaps all this conversation will inspire me. But yes, I have done scuba diving, but I am a little bit of a scary cat. I am no Simone Cousteau. <laughs> <laughs> Who is? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, Liz. This was a wonderful conversation and a wonderful film. Thank you so much, Eric. Okay.